Oh, that's right. It's time for Meet Me at the Diner, and it is the political season, and today we have Shannon Riley with us here. Actually, Robert Shannon Riley. He, of course, is running for House District 13, is that right? That's correct. That's correct, and you want to, uh, you'll be actually uh, having a runoff, a primary, coming up on the 12th. That's correct. That's right. So uh, how are you doing today, Shannon Riley? I'm great, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Well, well it's good to have you here. It's good to uh, meet you. I've uh, heard you you cook some fabulous barbecue out there. <laughs> I do enjoy cooking barbecue. I enjoy getting folks together. The, the, three, the three F's, I call it. The friends, fo uh, food, and fellowship. So oh, okay. it's a great way to get people together and enjoy each other. I thought you were going to say football there. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Well, we are here with Shannon today. If you've got a question, don't hesitate to give a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. Now, you are actually, you grew up right here in Greenwood, is that right? That's correct. I grew up over in the Harris Mill Village on Biltmore Street. Biltmore Street. And your dad, for years, was a banker at Palmetto Bank. That's correct. He, he started out in the early 60s at the Bank of Hodges and, uh, and was what I like to call a farmer banker. Farmer banker. A farmer banker. You he go actually. out and make loans right out at the farm. <laughs> <laughs> he actually, the only vacation he took was to bale hay twice a year. So, he uh, he did things the old-fashioned way with his customers, and and uh, his heart was was working on the farm and still is. And he actually retired um, four years ago after 43 years with the Palmetto Bank. And how is retirement for he, Sam? Oh no, for your dad. He's he's enjoying it. He he really is. He's Cute. he's building a shop and and uh, and uh, enjoying my nephew and and uh, enjoying the family. So. Um, he's having a real good time. That's excellent. That's excellent. Now you graduated from Greenwood High, and then you went to Erskine College, and you got a degree in natural sciences. That's correct. Yep. What did you want to do with that? Well, you know, I, I wasn't sure exactly. I, I I thought about going to medical school, but uh, but I changed my mind. I've always been a very much the hometown guy. Um, I'm very close to our family farm. And, uh, you know, I just decided uh, I didn't want to leave the, the family and leave the family farm to go off to medical school, so I decided to stay here locally. Okay. And, but what is natural sciences? What exactly do they consider that? Well, it was a combination of biology, chemistry, and physics. So instead of just having a concentration in one, I had a concentration in or a little bit of the, the each of three. Okay. Yeah. And while you were going to school, I understand you also uh, had a business. That's right. I owned a, a janitorial business I was a retired uncle. And, uh, you know, it allowed me to help me pay my way through school, mm -hmm. pay for my car insurance and my books and my gas, and, uh, and it, was, it was good to me. So it also gave me flexible hours so that I could study and, and, uh, and, and take care of things I needed to take care of. And being the son of a banker, it gave you that uh, responsibility issue, right? That's right. My, as, as a child, my parents never, never gave me things. They never gave me money. They never took me to the store and said, hey, what would you like? They always taught me a, a, a sense of ambition and, and work ethic. And, I, from a small child, I wanted to, to work for myself and provide for myself. So, uh, my parents also allowed me to make decisions at, at a young age, and they taught me, you know, the, the responsibility and and, and um, the way to do that. So that when I got to be a teenager, you know, I was I was pretty self sufficient. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. That's yeah. a good thing. Now, you have any sisters or brothers? I have a younger sister, Ashley, who's six years my junior. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, you have a sister, Ashley, and then so you were the big brother. I was the big brother. Hmm. Okay. So what what has made you decide that you wanted to run for political office? Sounds to me like you'd be perfectly happy staying on the farm. <laughs> I surely would. I, I you know the, the farm is my heart. It's my it's my um, where I like to be. And in fact, it's a big part of the reason I have my own business. It allows me to have spare time and free time so that I can be there. Uh, my dad and my uncles. Uh, we have some beef cows and pine trees in there. Uh, it's been in the family for 200 years, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's, it's taught me a lot over the years. It, it's taught me a hard work ethic. Uh, it's given me a sense of roots. Uh, I was very close to my paternal grandparents there, who were cotton farmers and who had 10 children. So we have a huge extended family, um, very close to my family. Uh, we still get together every Saturday at 12:30, and my aunt Georgia cooks lunch, and we have we have lunch with the family. And Saturday is my day to be on the farm and enjoy my time with the family. So if I had my way, that's what I would that's what I would like to do. My business gives me the time and, and, and allows me to do that, um, and it's where my heart is, where my passion is. Well, I guess a, a lot of uh, the commercial uh, businesses, you would be cleaning and doing janitorial services at night, too. That's correct. So that That's makes correct. it easier. It's all after hours. Now, how, how big a business do you have? I mean, you have uh, lots of employees? Nope, nope. It's very small. I only have a couple guys that work with me, 
and um, you know we have we have good relationships with our customers, and, and we work hard to to provide accountability and the best service that we can. So uh, we keep it small so that we can keep our quality high. Well, that's uh, that's good. That's good. But um, now, as a businessman, though, I suppose that there are issues that uh, you'd like to address going down there to Columbia. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I feel like in in, in our society these days, it, it's unfortunately it seems that oftentimes those of us who choose to be productive and work are penalized the most. Uh, meanwhile, there are those who just don't choose to be productive that have a huge sense of entitlement that just expect to get money from the government. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think uh, there are lots of, of, of concerns I have for those of us who choose to be productive, especially small business owners. What would you say would be one of the biggest issues for small business people? Well, you know, we need incentives to provide jobs for folks. You know, we, we provide more jobs than, than bigger corporations. Um, you know, we really get out there and get things done. Um, you know, one of the biggest challenges I face is workers' compensation rates. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, if I have more than three employees, I'm required by law to, to have workers' compensation. And that is based on the amount of, of payroll that you pay out. And, mm -hmm. and, and the rates are just through the roof. And, you know, it makes it extremely difficult to take on a new contract and, and to be able to grow when, when you can't afford those rates. Yeah, you know, how come the rates are so high? I mean, they're huge. I mean, they are, you know, I can remember years ago not paying that much for workers' comp. And then it went through the roof. And, and you know, it, it's kind of like health insurance as far as cost. But uh, workers' comp just is too expensive for what you're paying for. I, I agree. And, and, you know, I think there are certain times that, you know, that employers need to help employees that are hurt. And, you know, obviously there are times that are legitimate. But my biggest concern are frivolous lawsuits from, from lawyers. You know, I, I think that's a big part of the problem that goes right along with that sense of entitlement oftentimes. Well, I do believe down there in the House they did pass some caps on lawsuits this last year. But um, it, is that so much the caps, the size of it, or the more the frivolousness of it that you think is the issue? I think we definitely need caps, and I think, you know, we, we need tort reform. Um, but, you know, I think I think the frivolousness is at the heart of a lot of issues. You know, it's it's... You know, it, it, you have law enforcement officers that are concerned about um, doing the wrong thing and being sued, so they can't do their job the right way. You have healthcare professionals, professionals that are that are concerned about, you know, what if I do the wrong thing? So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be they're involved gonna in litigation. They're gonna. They, well, I think one of the things that happens in healthcare that we've seen over and over is they order so many more tests than you actually need because they're covering their butt. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I guess we're seeing the same thing when we come to uh, all these other suits. So it ends up costing us a lot more. How would you go about lowering the cost of workers' comp? Well, you know, first of all, I think we need to elect people to the legislature that are that are going for the right reasons, that, that don't want to use this position as a stepping stone, that don't want to be a judge, that, that don't want to create laws to do anything but benefit the public. And I think we need to do whatever whatever we can to to help small businesses create jobs. So I think, you know, certainly putting some caps on on those workers' comps, those workers' comp uh, rates would, would help and those lawsuits would help. How many people in the House of Representatives are actually lawyers? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what the percentage is. Maybe, but, maybe you can enlighten me. <laughs> I don't know right off the bat, but I know we have quite a few that are lawyers that are down there. And I know in Congress, in the U.S. Congress, we have a whole lot of lawyers exactly. up there. Exactly. And so do you think that that would be working at cross purposes to their best interest? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just say this. I feel we need more small business owners in Columbia. And, uh, you know, there's, That's a there's, hard job, though, to do because, you know, I guess you have flexibility because your business you can clean at night. Okay. You have your farming business. For, but for a lot of regular, everyday people to be able to take that four days a week for about half a year out, that's pretty impossible for a lot. That's right. And I'm really in a unique position to be able to do that. You know, yes. I have a, a very small business. Um, it, it's easy for me to manage it. You know, I, I don't have to be with it constantly every day. So I'm in a unique position as a small business owner to be able to go there and represent small business owners. And and I think that we need more of us there that work within budgets and, and certainly want to see the government work within, you know, a budget, just as I do at home and in my and in my business. 
Absolutely. Well, we are here with Shannon Riley. We are going to be back here in just a moment. Hey, if you've got a question for Shannon, give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229-7984. We'll be right back. All right, we're back here at Sharp Facets Gallery on the 72 Bypass. Yes, I'm Ann Eller. Yes, I'm here with Shannon Riley. He is running for House District 13 down there in Columbia. He wants to be a representative. He, uh, Gene Pinson, as we all know, is uh, retiring from this job, shall we say. And, uh, but you started running before, before Gene made that decision. I did. I, I announced back in September that I was going to run. I had a fundraiser in October, had a bunch of people over and raised some money, and decided back then that, that I wanted to run and to try to make a difference. Try to make a difference. What do you think is the biggest problem in trying to make a difference? Why, why, why do we have uh, representatives that can't quite make that difference? I'm, I'm sure it's a tough job to go to Columbia. You know, I've not been there as a representative, but I'm sure it's a tough job to go to Columbia and, and be able to be effective there in, in the, the atmosphere where you have to make laws and you have to rely on co-legislators to help you uh, support bills and also be able to, to reflect the interest of the folks here at home. And, and I'm sure that's a challenge. Sure. But do you think, you know, one of the things that people always accuse others that are already in political office is pandering to their constituents, you know, <laughs> trying to make the decision that just is good for to make them more successful in that job? Well, I don't think anybody should be elected and be a leader and, and just vote in a direction that the political winds are blowing. I think, I think you need to try to listen to your constituents based on the legislation that may be coming through that may pertain to them the most and listen to your folks back home and make the best decision you can for, for what's best for everybody. Now you have been out knocking on doors every time we talk to you you've always been knocking on doors. <laughs> what have you been hearing from the people that uh, you're trying to uh, find what they want in, an, in a person? Well you know I, I hear a lot of folks that say that, that, that they'd like to see more small business owners there they'd like to see folks there who are there for a shorter term they don't want to see people go there and be there for a long time, and, and I've even heard talks about you know, term limits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think the most important thing is they want sincere people to go there. Um, they're tired of seeing the corruption that they see on every level of politics in the media, and I think they want to see somebody go there who is sincere and who's doing this for the right reasons. What are the right reasons? Well, I believe the right reasons are that, that you humble yourself and you go there as, as someone who really wants to, to serve. Greenwood or serve your district, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. I think you know you, you go there because you, because you don't have ulterior motives. You don't have necessarily an agenda. Um, my agenda is simply this, and that is to be a sincere person, uh, to to maintain my integrity no matter what, which I always have done, uh, and and go there and, and represent folks uh, in a sincere manner. Have the people said that they were looking for something? I mean, if we got people that are looking for more jobs in, in our district, or we have people that are looking for lower taxes, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of things that people can say that are most important. What are the people telling you as being most important? I think what I hear most of all and at this point is, is, is transparency, especially referring or regarding those in district expenses. I, I hear that an awful lot at doors, and I hear that an awful lot from people, and I think rightly so. I think uh, I think folks are um, they just want to know the truth about how how things are being done within their in their leadership, especially regarding their tax dollars. Sure. Now, of course, down there in Columbia, they have in district expense. That Correct. is that is. Correct. Um, and I guess maybe one of the differences is that this was something that was voted on and put out there at the time that it was done down there in Columbia. Mm -hmm. So that it is uh, it is. Um, something that I guess would be considered transparent. Mm -hmm. I guess the issue here in Greenwood is the fact that we don't really think it was transparent. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as that goes, do the people know that there is, uh, I think it's $1,000 a month that, that you all get down there? I, I think there was, um, there was actually an article that was run in the, in the Next Journal uh, a few weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, that asked each of the three of us to weigh in on that, that transparency issue. Um, so I would assume that most folks are aware of that. Um, you know, there's a ten thousand four hundred dollar year salary, from what I understand. Um, You'll get rich on that one. <laughs> <laughs> All the reasons to do it. Uh, but you know, but but I think the important thing to consider with with a state house level race is, you know, this district is is the majority of Greenwood County. This district, being House Thirteen, is the majority of Greenwood County, and it stretches from the Abbeville County line and Wearshoals 
all the way down to the south end of the county. It includes Epworth, Sand Ridge, Callison. It goes all the way over and includes 96, touches the lake. It's a huge district. So, you know, that $1,000 in district expense would include you know, me paying for an office that I would have here locally so that constituents could come and meet with me and talk with me about their concerns. It would have include... you thought about a bigger car? <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe even a smart car. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a small one, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it would include gas expenses, postage, you know, any any uh, secretarial support that I may be able to get. And in this area. Now, down there in Columbia, right. you'll have an office and exactly. you'll actually share it with another uh, representative, I believe. Exactly. And I believe you share a secretary with another, yes. with another or an assistant with another legislator. But, but the, and for the time that you're here, and that's one thing that I'm very concerned about, about doing, and one thing that I'm passionate about doing is constituent servant, uh, being, consti being a constituent servant and constituent service. And so, you know, I've never been in this job, so I don't know what type of in-district expenses it's going to take, you know, to be able to do my job as a as a real constituent service here in the off season. Um, Just out of curiosity, would if you didn't use the money, would you give it back? Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't have a problem with that. But and, and the other thing is, you know, I keep personal receipts for everything that I spend in my personal finances, mm -hmm. in my business finances, and I certainly would keep receipts for everything that I did, you know, as a legislator, uh, spending other folks' tax dollars in, in, in an expense type situation. Sure. Well, that would be unique, keeping receipts. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I think that's common sense. It is common sense. But that's where some of the things that no receipts, just take the money, makes it kind of hard to understand, isn't it? Right. And, and let me just say that I don't know the facts in, in the county council issue with those right. district expenses. I think, you know, SLED has been called in from what I understand the Ethics Commission to take a look at that, and I'm sure they'll get to the bottom about the ethics of that, I, but I do not know the details about exactly how that money was taken or the facts, so I try not to weigh in on, on those things if I, that I don't know the facts about. Well, one thing we do know, they didn't have to provide any receipts. That is one thing that we do know, and that they actually were taking out taxes on the money, so we right. do know those. Those right. are the right. things we do know right. for sure. Um, now, as far as going down there to Columbia, what type of experiences do you think have prepared you to be able to do this? Because you're, you're a new politician, you're not a, a seasoned politician here. And I think that's a great thing, yeah. I mean, and, and I make jokes about the P word, because, you know, let's face it, the term politician has become such a, ne has such a negative connotation these days because of the corruption, because of things that have happened. And so, you know, I think that's a good thing. I think that brings a fresh new start. What, what qualifications I do have is that, you know, one, that I've been here my entire life and, and I know the people here. And one thing I like about this, this district, our redistricting this year, is this district includes the majority of the rural areas in Greenwood. It, it leaves out Greenwood City, but it's Hodges, Ware Shoals, 96, Sand Ridge, Epworth, Cowson, all those rural areas. I'm a small town guy and I love the small town. I love, I love the atmosphere in the small town. Not that I don't love Greenwood because I do. You know, my heart's here. And I've always wanted to be here, but I'm excited about the opportunity of, of being able to represent, you know, the rural areas. And you know, as a small business owner, as someone who has made my own way, you know, I understand what it means to work within a budget all the time. You know, I simply do not spend more money than I take in. That's common sense. You know, um, you know, my it's not a lot of fun, though, is no, it? No, it's not a lot of fun. <laughs> and particularly I, I, I in this economy, you were telling <laughs> right. me you lost what thirty percent of your right, business right. You since know, the economy tanked. Right, yeah. and, and I've been very fortunate to be able to, to maintain the business that I do have, and, and and very appreciative of the customers that I have, and we have great relationships. But you know, you know, if you run a small business, a successful business, you know, it 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 gives you a lot of experience about about how to manage your finances, and you know, and and having to pay your your guys that work with you first. You know, before you get paid every oh, every month. Oh, I every understand month. that. <laughs> and and you know, you got it. You got to make sure the bottom line is there. You got to make sure you're accountable to your people. You got to make sure that you know everything is done. And so, after doing that for a long time, you know, it's a big step to go out and leave a, a, a corporate job, and and work on your own and start your own business and 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 face that. You know, Absolutely. and I've been fortunate to be able to do that. And I like to think it's a positive thing that I'm not a, a prior politician. I think um, you know another thing that I hear from folks at doors is is they're tired of the typical typical folks to go to Columbia to be elected. You know, I think I think uh, it's an honorable thing to go there. Our, our founding fathers, they were working men that, that, that didn't go to the legislature or Congress and, and, and make laws all the time. They, they worked and they traveled back and forth. Absolutely, and, they did. Hey, we're going to hear South Carolina news already in progress. When we come back, we're talking to Shannon Riley running for District 13 in the primary election, which is Jan June 
excuse me, June 12th. Coming up, we'll be right back. Arg, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? Or a college tuition hung on a wall? Or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box? Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. All right, we're back here with Shannon Riley. He is running for District 13. He is a Republican. They will be having a primary runoff, shall we say, on June 12th. And it's getting down, down to the wire here. How long have you been campaigning for this job? I've been campaigning since last September, Ann. Wow. Well, you should have a good feel on how people feel about things. <laughs> you should. Yeah. I, have, I have a pretty good feel. Yeah? I do. You know, you were just telling me that uh, the methamphetamines, that you're a constable. Now, what exactly does a constable do? Well, it's a, the state constable program for South Carolina is a reserve program, um, law enforcement program. We're given a state commission. Uh, we work through uh, through SLED, and we're regulated through SLED. The SLED will allow us to work with any agency in the state who needs assistance. So, um, you know, you can work with various agencies around the state to, to do so. And uh, I work. Who have you worked with? I've worked with um, with Erskine College Public Safety, North Augusta Public Safety, uh, Presbyterian College Public Safety. But for the past three years, I've had the privilege of working with the Abbeville County Sheriff's Office. How are things over there at the Abbeville County Sheriff's Office? Well, I tell you, some great men and women that, that serve over there, and I've had I've had a, a, an honor to be with them and serve a lot of hours. Uh, before my before my campaign started here, I was putting in about thirty hours a week there uh, with them. So, do you um, get paid for that? I, I don't get paid for it. It's a I provide all my own equipment, um, my gun belt, my uh, my uniform, uh, my, my bulletproof vest, uh, my gas to and from. Uh, Abbeville, but it's but it's been a great rewarding experience for me. I've gotten to see a lot of great things and work with a lot of great officers. What's the thing that disturbs you the most about what, um, well, using Abbeville since that's where you're working mm -hmm. out of, what disturbs you the most? Well, I think one of the biggest problems we see and we face every day is, is dealing with folks who, who manufacture, use, and sell methamphetamines. It's, it's an epidemic and it's a problem. You know, uh, I think we've done a good job over there of, of uh, the officers over there have done a good job of uh, keeping it keeping it at bay, but it's a, it's a huge force. It's a huge problem. It's such a it's so different than a lot of the other drugs, and it's it's a it's a gateway drug. It it you know it causes people to steal. It causes them to become destitute. It causes them to do whatever they have to do to get their next their next um, fix for meth, and and it's it's a huge problem. It's also made it very difficult for me to buy Sudafed. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to go on the record with that right now. <laughs> Well, that, I feel too. guilty every time I go to buy some Sudafed, folks. I don't know about anybody else, but they ask you 60 questions, and you say, gee, do I really want it? <laughs> but um, well, what do you think can be done about it? I mean, we have the same, of course, right here in Greenwood. One of the good things that I think we have here in Greenwood is that we have a sheriff and a police department that work together, share a lot of info, and uh, working together with resources. Absolutely, and, and that's, that's a key part. You know, you have to work together. Um, you know, the sheriff and the chiefs here, and, and in every county, they have their work cut out for them dealing with this problem. It is, it is, it is like I said, a huge epidemic. Um, you know, it's it's largely a rural problem. You, you have people out in rural areas that are that are making it back in the woods, and um, you know, and the enforcement of it can be tough. You know, the, the cleanup of those labs can be can be quite a challenge. You know, identifying those labs and exactly what you have, and it, well, how do you it, it cut can, it back? Well, I'll tell you. I think I think what I'm for is, is if I'm elected, is going to Columbia. You know, having having seen the amount of time that I've seen and worked in law enforcement firsthand, and seeing the struggles that these guys are dealing with, um, is is stiffer statutes and stiffer penalties for those that have anything to do with meth. Um, what is it right now? If you're picked up with it. Well, you know, it's it's their varying charges. You know, if, if you know ultraphedrine, uh, um, if you call it possession of ultraphedrine, uh, it's it's a greater charge of up to I think it's up to five years and a felony if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know. But, but what we need to see is those cases prosecuted and those cases those people made examples of so that other folks choose to not do that. You know, I also don't know if we, if, you know, what we need to do to try to rehabilitate these people um, that, that are involved and become addicted to meth because it, it leads to so many other problems. It leads to a lot of the burglars we have. You know, it leads to other violent crimes. And, and you know, that's, that's a difference in some of the other drugs, meth and the other drugs we see. 
So um, this is something that w you would want to see uh, handled tougher out of Columbia for statewide. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, other things that you think are really important to be covering statewide, um, you know, where do you stand on immigration? That's, that's a, and the voter ID. Those are two issues that are really big out here. Where do you stand on those two issues, Shannon? Well, you know, I think, I think let me take the voter's ID first. Okay. Um, I think I have to provide an ID for everything that I do in this mm -hmm. society. You know, if, if I'm going to get a cell phone, I have to prove who I am. You're going to get Sudafed. If I'm going to get Sudafed, I, <laughs> I have to prove who I am. Right. You know, I can't function in this society without an ID. You know, and, and, and I think that, you know, when you have so many voters that voted in the last election that, that you know, were you know, maybe not even alive or even confident to vote, um, Over 900 I'm, people right, is am, what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. and I am, I, am, you know, I am for having to prove who you are to be able to vote. So you think the voter ID is, is, a, uh, is realistic? I do. I, you know, I, I personally think that uh, Governor Haley did go out of her way to say that those that didn't have ID, that they would make sure they would transport them to get an ID. Mm -hmm. I find it very hard to believe that maybe there are some older people that don't have IDs, but most people need an ID to do anything, whether you work with a bank or, uh, you know, when most everybody has to work with a bank, when you have a job, you have to have an ID. That's right. And, and you know, that's yet another problem we see in law enforcement. When you, when you stop, you know, someone in a car and you try to ID them, you know, if they're not a driver in the vehicle, they could have warrants. They could be wanted, you know, out of another county. And if they don't have an ID, they give you a name and date of birth, and it comes back not on file. There's not a lot of recourse sometimes to figure out who they are. So, you know... Um, you know, I think I think we need IDs. I think if we're going to have a fair voting process, mm -hmm. I think that we need we need to be able to identify the voters. Absolutely. All right, now for the big one, immigration. Where do you stand on immigration here? That's a, that's been a big big issue. You know, number one, it's really a federal issue, mm -hmm. but it affects us on the state level on how to deal with illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. Well, here's here's my take on that. We've created a, a huge sense of entitlement in our society. I believe, um, you know, we need to help those who truly cannot help themselves. Veterans, special needs, senior citizens, you know, they should have a sense of entitlement. We owe it to them to help them. They've, they've paid the ultimate sacrifice. They've worked for years, paid into Social Security. We, you know, they, they can't help themselves. We need to help those people. But only half of us are paying income taxes now, and we're supporting the other half of the country who, who don't, who choose not to in a lot of cases. You know, so that, that sense of entitlement you know, is, is, a, is a big problem, I think. I think, first of all, we find a way to, to differentiate between those people who truly need help mm -hmm. and those people who are milking the system, and we do away with those folks who are milking the system. I think that ought to go a long way to, to creating or doing away with the need for jobs that we have here for illegal immigrants. Isn't one of the issues that we, we have people that wouldn't want to take the jobs that a lot of our immigrants are willing to take? Absolutely. And aren't the immigrants actually, in some cases, willing to stand up and work as hard as it takes to get the job done, as many hours as it takes? And we have people that, do we have people that want to work that hard? I think you hit a key point there, and I think we don't have a lot of people who are willing to work that hard because they can, they can stay home and get a check and not have to work hard. And I think that's why we have to cut that out. You know, I, so are you saying that, we, that unemployment should not be available? No, I think unemployment for people who are truly trying to find jobs and can show that they're trying to find jobs, you know, can, can be proactive or be active members of, or productive members of society. And so I think that, that I'm not saying we should totally do away with unemployment, well, we should do away with unemployment for extended period of times for people who choose not to do certain jobs. I think there is, there is a job that we could all do and we could find to be productive. Uh, and, and I think we need, to, we need to start to differentiate a little bit better. I think one of the problems is because the economy has been so bad, we have people who are we have people that are taking jobs that they wouldn't normally have taken. So that's put people in the lower rungs even further down the list mm -hmm. to find a job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's my take on that. If you know, if 12 years ago, if I can go out and and you know and take a vacuum cleaner and a bottle of Windex and start a business from scratch, scrubbing toilets. I think that there that there are jobs that people can do out there, and and I think that I think that it comes down to again that personal accountability and and, and that sense of entitlement and and you choosing to be productive and and choosing to, to want to help yourself. 
So are, are you saying that we have, we have an issue with uh, responsibility and getting out there and doing whatever is necessary? Absolutely. Absolutely. And how do you change that philosophy? <laughs> you take away the alternatives. Take away the alternatives? Yeah, and, and, you know, let me talk about prioritization on a, on a personal level, on a personal financial level. You know, I, you know, I, I live in an 800-square-foot house. I drive a Chevrolet pickup truck that I bought new 11 years ago that has 450,000 miles on it. You know, could, Chevrolet and, and, probably would like to talk to you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to hit the 500,000-mile mark and hopefully be on commercial. No, but, but, you know, I prioritize it in my house. You know, I might, I might want satellite TV, I might want a lot of luxuries, but I may choose to do without those things because I have to have health insurance. You know, I feel that it's, it's, it's top of the priority list. So I pay a lot of money, even though I'm a healthy young male, you know, I pay a lot of money every month because I choose to, to have health insurance and I make, you know, sacrifices in other areas. And I think people on a personal level don't do that oftentimes. Well, they did a study the other day I saw on TV where where having a cell phone, cable TV, TV, and all these other things were of utmost priority to a lot of people. And I believe that. But, you know, those are certainly things we can all live without. So how do you change society to feel that way? You're saying that just by taking away the, the handouts, I guess you're calling them, that people would stand up and start doing what's right? I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> are you willing to have a social experiment here? <laughs> You know, I can tell you if, if the, you know, if, if there's no one person that has the answer or the solution to all these problems that have created, that have been created over such a length of time, you know, this, this sense of entitlement has evolved, you know, over, over a period of decades. And, you know, I, I think that we have to do everything we can to try to, to teach folks that they need to be self-sufficient as much as possible. That there's not an unlimited government with unlimited resources there that can continue to provide for them just because they may not have the incentive or, or, or choose to take the initiative to provide for themselves. You know, one of the things that uh, down there in Columbia, they have had more money coming in because there's been more taxes coming in from sales tax. There's been more income tax coming in. Um, so they have had more money coming in. So they've been trying to figure out how to spend all this money. Do you think we should spend all this money or should money be put aside for uh, what used to be called the rainy day account? <laughs> Well, being the son of a conservative farmer banker, let me just tell you, I think we should we should uh, we should take that money and pay down other debts. That would be my first priority. And you know, and that's another thing: prioritization on the government level, you know, within the legislature. I think we have to look at all the priorities that of things that need to be taken care of. And and you know, we 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 spend the money in the areas that we need to. If we have a surplus left over, you know, we either pay down debts with that or or put that into you know, some, some groups and some, some areas that we need to, that we also need to address. And one of the other issues down there in Columbia is the tax, the tax, uh, income tax. That's been a, uh, they keep talking about that it's a uh, hose that's been uh, repaired so many times. Do you feel we should go ahead and just scrap the whole system and start over? Or do you think that, um, what do you think as far as taxes? In specifically income, income tax. tax. Income tax, yes. Well, I feel like I pay too much. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, there are um, those that probably think you pay too little. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure so. I am, I, there's no doubt in my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know a lot about the income tax um, overhaul or the, the, the things they've done to try to reform the income tax. Um, well, there are a lot of there are a lot of deductions and things that are able to be taken mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. and, and let's just take deductions as a general category. Mm -hmm. Do you think there should be the loophole quote deductions? Or should we be paying a, a flat rate that just, uh, here it is. Regarding sales tax or income tax? Income tax. Well, you know, that's a tough call. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is? It, it, it really is. It really is. And, and I tell you, you know, I, I think, you know, the most fair of taxes is a consumption tax. And I don't know all the ins and outs of the, of the tax structure because that's one thing that I'm trying to learn about here. Mm -hmm. but, I do, but I do feel a more fair tax is a consumption tax. I agree with you. I mean, I would like to see something like that. And uh, when we lived in Florida, there was no income tax. It was all based, you had a higher sales tax, per se. Mm -hmm. We, of course, here in Greenwood County, they'll be dropping that one cent, I believe it is the end of June. Mm -hmm. I knew when TJ Maxx and Michaels and all these new stores came, it would help pay it off. And by God, it did. <laughs> <laughs> But if you were down there in Columbia and you were looking back up here at Greenwood, 
How about jobs? How about getting more industry into our area? What do you think it would take, Shannon? Well, you know, one concern I have is 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 our roads and our infrastructure. You know, I think a lot of folks think that the first thing companies look at when they move to an area is is the quality of our education. Mm -hmm. And I know that's one of the most important things they looked at. They look at, but I think oftentimes they look at first and foremost our infrastructure, and you know how close we are to an interstate. How good are our roads and bridges and our water systems and our sewer systems? So, you know, well, how do you think we stack up? Water, I think we got good water. Yeah, we've yeah. got good water. Yeah, and I, I think the biggest concern I have is, you know, is is you know, in my lifetime, I think our roads and bridges are in the worst condition I've seen them in in in, in my life. So I think we have to find a way to help improve our infrastructure, and and make it a place that you know that folks can actually. Get their goods and get goods and services to the places they need to be. Well, we got two issues now. We got the federal government on that one, <laughs> <laughs> and we have the state government. Well, you know, and part of isn't part of the problem is the fact that we're not actually getting some of the funds that should be coming back here to the state from the federal government coming back here. I think that is one of the issues that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Two, I don't believe we have any contracts out there because of what happened with the DOT last year. They are just uh, not spending any money right now. Mm -hmm. So how do how do we how do we strike that balance? And where does the money come from that uh, would build our infrastructure or redo our infrastructure? Well, I think that's a good question. I think there you know um, you know there there has to be some some source of funding for for everything that we do. And I think when you go to Columbia and you look at a budget on you know, on, on everything we have to look at, I think, you know, you, you have to take from one to give to another. And, and I think that could be a problem. Or else you raise taxes. You know, so I don't, I don't know what the best solution for that is. Should we raise taxes? <laughs> <laughs> As a general rule, I, should, I would say no. I'm not, for raising, I'm not for raising taxes. But, you know, you don't know what we might have to do one day. Sure. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we're going to have to take a hard look at what it's going to take to be able to fund these these roads and bridges that you know are so dilapidated and you know bridges that that you know that that are just really not being held up by much and that, that you know we're going to get to a point very soon I think that they're just not going to be safe for travel. You know, one of the things that I think has become an issue as we've become more what word shall I make up here? Part aside, we become very party oriented. You know, whether it's Republican or Democrat. And I think in some aspects, has that hurt us in order to make things come together to have such as roads and infrastructure and things like that happen? That we can't be the party of no and the party of yes because there never can be a maybe or let's work this out. Right. What do you think? I think, I think absolutely our, our government has become polarized, way too polarized, and, and I think that's a big problem. You know, would you re reach across the aisle to make things happen? I would. I would love to think that I can do that. You know, I want to go to Columbia with with my integrity and my values, and 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 you know, treating the people the way that I want to be treated. And you know, there are certain fundamental issues that I'm never going to agree with a Democrat on ever. But certainly, there have to be some issues that that we can agree on, so that we can get down there and do some things for the common good. What would you never be able to agree with? Um, abortion. Or, abortion. Or. or for instance, you know, life begins at conception. You know, um, you know, some some other fundamental issues like um, um, same-sex marriages. I, I would not support those. You would not support same-sex marriage. No. Marriage, I believe, is between a man and a woman. Okay. So, do you think though that we could come together on some road issues, or education <laughs> issues, or immigration? I know that I can. <laughs> I, know, I know that I can. Yeah. All right. So, and I'd like to think that there are other folks that can too. Absolutely. All right. Well, we've been talking about a lot of different issues. Now, the balanced budget. Basically, we're supposed to have a balanced budget down there in Columbia. Right. Not like the federal government. Right. Okay. So but, but it is, in some aspects, not balanced because of the timing of it. Is that correct? The timing of when you make the budget versus when the money actually comes in. Well, you know... Um, Again, yeah, yeah, and that's that's one of those things that, that I'm about to get down there and get in the middle of to really understand. Right. You know. But do you feel that it should be balanced all the way down the line? I, I, I think as much as possible, I do. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you think that um, you, you're big into accountability. I am. What does that mean? Well, that means that when you look at somebody and you tell them you're going to do something, 
that, that you hold yourself responsible to them um, regardless of the outcome of the situation. And you have no problem with transparency or telling people how you voted or anything. I know that was a big issue the last time about mm -hmm. whether we would take a, um, uh, on the record voting down there in Columbia. One of the things that I understand Nikki Haley has done that I like is she's made it very easy for you to see what your legislators have done and how they voted. And, you know, I know there are a lot of parliamentary moves that go on behind the scenes down there that may be hard to see. But, you know, if, if we're going to represent folks, I think we need to be completely transparent and as to how we vote, what our attendance record is. You know, I'm 100% I'm for that. What do you think about attendance? Are you going to be there all the time? I mean, you know, it's got to be difficult to be down there. Well, I think folks are electing me to be there, mm -hmm. and I think I need to be there, you know, 100% of the time if possible. Absolutely. What, what type of committees would you like to serve on if you were given the option to choose? Well, um, being, being a farmer at heart and being from an, an old southern cotton farming family, I, I, my, my heart is near and dear to the farmers and the agricultural business. Um, I'm also um, very passionate about law enforcement, you know, I said earlier. And, and I'd love the opportunity to serve on, on any of those uh, law enforcement related committees. Absolutely. Well, we have exactly three minutes left here. I'm going to turn it over to you and let you tell the people what you want them to know. I've asked a lot of questions here today and I certainly have enjoyed it, Shannon. Well, I've enjoyed it too, Ann, and I appreciate you giving this opportunity for folks to get to know me a little better. Sure. Um, you know, the main thing I want folks to know is that, that, I'm, that I'm sincere in what I'm doing. You know, I'm running for office because you know, I've never held office before, and, and, and I don't want to be a cliché politician. You know, I want to be someone who's sincere, someone who's accessible, someone who can call me anytime they need me with an issue, and me be able to get back to them and address their issue. You know, I want to be able to tell folks where I stand on issues. Um, you know, I don't want to tell them what they want to hear. I want to tell them where I stand and, and why I stand the way that I do. But one of the biggest things I want to do is be a listener. That's one thing I've tried to do for the past eight months is, is spend as much time listening, if not more time, than talking. Because if you're going to represent someone, it implies to me that you have to be a listener. So I want folks to know that if I am given the opportunity and the privilege to serve Greenwood, that I am going to, that I am going to listen to them. And I'm going to be just as accessible to them uh, after the election and for the years that I serve as I am prior to the, to the years that I serve. Because my heart is truly that of a servant, and I'm most fulfilled when I'm helping others. How do your parents feel about you running? How does what does Hugh say about all this? Did he say, "Oh my God, what are you doing to yourself"? <laughs> well, you know the the, the you know um, the, the the neat thing about that is my family has always supported me in, in everything that I do, and you know I, I think uh, hopefully I've made them proud and that that I've maintained my integrity and my reputation over the years here, and that I've wanted to stay here and be close to the family, and close to the farm, and they've been very very supportive of me. Uh, and, and everything that I've done in my entire life, but especially this. I think they're very proud of what I'm doing. Uh, I think they're, they're proud that I'm doing it for the right reasons. And um, they've been happy to help me with all these signs. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of signs. <laughs> there were a lot of signs before anybody else had any signs out there, just for the record. <laughs> well, Shannon Riley, it certainly has been a pleasure to have you here on the show. We sure wish you the best. Of course, this is coming up on the 12th. Everybody that is, uh, if they have a question or they want to call you, what should they do? Please call me anytime. My, my number is, is my cell phone number. It's 992-4585. You can call me, the, call me there anytime. Uh, it's the only number I have. Um, I'm glad to talk with them personally. Uh, of course, the next couple of weeks are going to be extremely busy, but I'll be glad to call you back and talk with you as soon as I can. Um, also, uh, you can send me an email uh, through my website, uh, but that address is Shannon at RileyForHouse.com. So, and please. the website is? Uh, www.rallyforhouse.com Having any more barbecues before? I understand you're a heck of a cook. <laughs> Probably not before, but we'll definitely have one after to celebrate. And also I encourage folks to take a look at my website, look at the issues. You actually have to click on the issues button to be able to see the issues on the website. So just this please is, encourage everybody to vote. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. We have been talking with Shannon Riley here. I understand I have another guest that's going to be here in less than five minutes. That's right. Uh, Marsha Kelly Clark is going to be here. So don't you go away. You stay right with us. I hope we're going to hear the news, and we'll be right back.